So in my talk, I'm going to draw on some of the, the research that Dave's mentioned, but I've pitched it at quite a, a general level as well. So I'm going to start off by looking at why water is so important for human health. I'll look at causes of water pollution and uh, give some examples of specific health impacts. And then uh, later on, look at solutions to these issues. And at the end, I'm just going to highlight what I think are some of the, the key issues for water pollution and health in both developing and developed countries. So to, to start off with uh, why water is so important for human health, as the, the figure shows here, water is involved in numerous processes within the, the human body, from the function of the, the brain to regulation of temperature, flushing out waste products, uh, digestion, and so on. And on average, in the average human being, water accounts for 72% of your body mass, so it's a vital component of the human body. And therefore, anything affecting water quality will have impacts on human health. And just to put things in perspective, I always find this statistic really shocking. This is a, an estimate that there are 4 million deaths due to lack of clean water every year. And that's the equivalent of 34 jumbo jets crashing every day, every day of the year. And it's something we don't tend to hear about. There's something in the, the news if one jumbo jet crashes or disappears, but yet all the, the time there's this very large um, death rate due to lack of clean water. There's also increasing research that water is important for mental health. And this is a figure taken from a paper by... Uh, Joe Barton and Jules Pretty at the uh, University of Essex and they conducted a meta-analysis of 10 previous studies which had followed about 1,200 people in the UK which looked at the effect of exercising in different types of environments on mental health. And this is one of the, the key figures from their paper I'm not sure if you can read the text at the bottom, but it shows different types of environments in which people are exercising. And the, the y-axis is the benefit of exercising in a particular environment on measures of self-esteem. And what you can see is that exercising in waterside environments, although it's got quite a large error bar around the result, had the greatest effect on self-esteem. So there's also growing evidence about water environments and clean water having benefits for mental health. The importance of water for human health is being recognised by the United Nations. And some of you may be familiar with this already, that one of the Millennium Development Goals was to halve the population of people without access to safe water and sanitation by 2015. And the goal for access to safe water was achieved earlier on this year. However, it's important to remember that this is only to halve the proportion of the population without this access. And even though the goal for access to uh, safe water has been met, that still leaves almost 250 million people worldwide without access to clean water. And there's still a lot of progress required to achieve the goal to, for access to sanitation. In addition, the United Nations passed several years ago a motion to recognise the human right to safe drinking water and sanitation. So internationally, the importance of the, the link between clean water and human health is acknowledged. 
So I'm now going to have a look at sources of water pollution, what affects our water quality. And this is a slide which illustrates that there are a whole range of activities, human activities in the environment which can pollute water. So it's ranging from urban development, waste disposal, for example in landfills or um, human sewage disposal, there are agricultural activities as well which affect our water quality. And what this slide also shows is that both the quality of surface waters such as rivers and lakes can be affected but also ground waters deep within the geology and soils. And in fact groundwater pollution is often of, of greater concern than surface water pollution because of the very long residence times that are typical of groundwaters. So even if we stopped spreading all manure on agricultural land tomorrow, it might take 20 or 40 years before the <coughs> pollution caused by those practices would um, be diluted within groundwater. So groundwater protection is particularly important. So what's shown here is a, a whole range of human activities which can cause water pollution. But it's important to remember that there are also natural uh, causes of polluted water. And another key thing to think about with regarding water pollution is to discriminate between point, what are called point sources and non-point sources. So point sources of water pollution are what we typically think about in terms of water pollution and it be discharges from pipes, from factories or sewage treatment works. They're called point sources because they are easy to identify, monitor and regulate. You can see exactly what the source of the pollution is. What's more difficult to deal with is non-point source or diffuse pollution. And this is where pollutants are released over a large area over time. For example, it could be nitrate leaching from fertiliser applied to agricultural fields. It could be uh, storm events in city centres washing off heavy metals deposited on urban highways. And you know, an image shown here, this is a runoff from agricultural land with a, a lot of suspended sediment in it. So non-point or diffuse pollution is more difficult to identify, regulate and control because it's spread over large areas, may be gradually released over time or may occur in short time periods and not in others. So to address this type of pollution often requires changes in land use or changes in behaviour and this type of pollution typically accounts for the majority of water pollution today. So in addition to this distinction between point and non-point source pollution, we need to remember that there are natural causes of water pollution. And probably one of the best known examples of this is the epidemic of arsenic a poisoning as a result of contaminated groundwater occurring in Bangladesh and West Bengal in India. So this is the, the world's largest of documented <coughs> outbreak of arsenic poisoning. It's estimated to affect tens of millions of people in this area. And arsenic poisoning through consumption of water with high concentrations of arsenic manifests itself in after several years in cancers of the skin, as shown here, and other parts of the body. The cause of the 
high arsenic concentrations in groundwaters, however, is not due to human activity, it's due to the, the presence of arsenic in the sediments from which the groundwater is drawn and the particular conditions in the sediment enable the dissolution of arsenic so that it becomes mobile and enters water which is tapped from the groundwater by pumps and tube wells such as this. And ironically, the, the cause of this is because efforts were made in the, the 1980s to switch from surface waters in many areas of Bangladesh, which were contaminated with bacteria from sewage, switching to groundwater, which was perceived as a cleaner source of water. And it was only discovered later on that there were naturally high concentrations of arsenic in many of these groundwater sources. So that's a, an example of what natural water pollution because of the, the combination of particular environmental conditions. Moving to Scotland, this is some of the, the area I've been uh, researching in my career. And as Dave mentioned, that was looking at a trace metal called manganese in surface waters which were used for drinking water supply. So this is an example from Loch Braddon, which is a major drinking water reservoir in the southern uplands in southwest Scotland. And the, the graph at the bottom shows the, the measured manganese concentrations in the reservoir water entering the treatment works compared with the, the pink line towards the bottom, which is the EC maximum admissible concentration for manganese and you can see a, a big spike here in manganese concentrations uh, in 1996 and because of this Scottish water spent about one and a half million pounds upgrading the water treatment works at Loch Braddon principally to improve the removal of manganese the source of the manganese is again natural. It occurs in most rocks and soils. And the particular combination of soil and climatic conditions, again in this area, uh, facilitate the mobilization of that manganese into the water supply. So that's just to emphasize that there are natural sources of water <coughs> pollution. It's not entirely due to human activities. So now going to look at some examples of how water pollution affects human health. So I've already um, mentioned chemical components of water such as arsenic, such as manganese. There may also be organic compounds, hydrocarbons which uh, have been shown to affect human health and typically they normally affect human health after a number of years of exposure. You don't see get skin cancer from drinking one glass of water with a high arsenic concentration. You have to consume that contaminated water for a number of years. I've also um, noted radionuclides here just to complete the picture, but generally they're, they're not a, a big concern in terms of water pollution. What is of much greater concern are pathogenic microorganisms, bacteria, viruses and parasites that can be ingested through contaminated water. And I've got a sort of couple of examples of these. So one of them is uh, an oocyst uh, known as cryptosporidium. It's uh, a few micrometers in diameter. And as with many microorganism contamination of drinking water, it enters water supplies by 
contaminated hosts, um, their faeces uh, coming into contact with the water. So it could be disposal, poor disposal of human sewage. It could be uh, faeces from agricultural livestock, <coughs> cattle, sheep. It could be wild animals, which enters the drinking water. And then the, the oocyst is ingested by the host, reproduces in the, the body, causes illness, in this case, um, diarrheal illness, which is normally um, not life-threatening, but can be more serious in the very young, the very old, and the immunocompromised. So the organism reproduces in the, the host, which um, excretes more oocysts, which can contaminate the water, and so the, the cycle continues. So safe water management is trying to, to break this cycle and separating out disposal of waste from water supplies. Also mention another example is guinea worm, and this is um, carried by uh, water, water fleas which are infected by guinea worm larvae. It's virtually eradicated now, there are just a few hundred cases last year in, in four countries in Africa. It particularly occurs in the, the dry season where water supplies are concentrated in stagnant pools. The um, water fleas uh, ingested in drinking water if it's not filtered properly. The larvae then uh, reproduce inside the body and the, the worm appears about a year later, normally in the lower limb of the body. And the pain that it causes normally induces people to bathe their foot in water, at which point the, the guinea worm comes out and infects the water and so the cycle continues. So again, it's um, a cycle of infected hosts contaminating water again and with guinea worm there are measures to try and break the cycle by ensuring that people who are infected don't bathe their, their feet in water supplies. In addition to these causes of water pollution there are emerging pollutants and a major one is like to be endocrine disruptors so these are a whole suite of compounds derived from uh, pharmaceuticals. It could be personal care products which enter water systems <coughs> from sewage treatment works often. And we know that individually they can um, cause health effects which can be passed through the generations in other animals. We don't know much about the, the synergy, the interaction of these thousands of compounds in human beings. So there aren't actually any drinking water standards for these compounds yet because we, we don't really know enough about them in order to set these standards. What's shown here is the results from a survey of surface water and ground waters in the United States a few years ago which tested for a whole range of these compounds and the, the y-axis shows the percentage of these waters tested which contained particular types of compounds. So you can see that about two-thirds of the waters tested, the surface waters contained steroids, over 50% contained evidence of non-prescription drugs and other compounds found antibiotics, pesticides and other drugs. And typically it was found that every water tested contained on average four types of endocrine disruptors. So this is something to, to watch for the future. 
So I'm going to move on now to have a look at how do we address these water pollution problems and obviously different solutions are appropriate for different types of water pollution and their sources. So one is dealing with point pollution sources by regulation and treatment and this is, is quite advanced in developed countries. There's been legislation around the last 40 years which when it's enforced can deal quite effectively with point sources. Diffuse pollution is more difficult to deal with as I mentioned earlier and here you might aim to reduce the contamination at source and I'll look at some examples of this in a minute. You might use sustainable treatment systems and there are also um, procedural changes, changes in planning and behaviour. For example, with good planning, you would decide not to locate a landfill site over a groundwater drinking supply, but locate it somewhere where it poses less risk to water sources. And there's also reducing human exposure, either by using alternative water sources or by distributing treatment, particularly in developing countries. One example of this shown here is a household bio sand filter within a, a home in Kenya, which helps to ensure that there's safe drinking water supply within that household. So in terms of regulation, how, what is safe drinking water? What are we aiming for? The World Health Organization sets guidelines for drinking water quality and they're updated every few years. And these, it is these guidelines which are normally form the basis for national legislation. And they, they form the basis for the European Community Drinking Water Directive, which has been around for over 30 years. And the, the EU also has regulations to do with the quality of water that can be used as a water source before it's had any treatment. So there's, there's quite a long history of regulation for safe drinking water in the EU. And these directives are then incorporated into national legislation in each member country. This is what things look like in <coughs> Scotland. In Scotland, drinking water quality is regulated by the, the drinking water quality regulator and it scrutinises the, the data provided by Scottish Water who are obliged under the drinking water directive to, to sample at particular frequencies and to report their results. So these are the results for sort of 10 key water quality parameters from last year, from 2013. So a couple of points to note here. There's pretty good compliance. The scale here is from 95% compliance, the bottom to 100%. So most, most parameters are complied with 99% of the time. And it's, there is quite a lot of evidence that drinking tap water is actually safer than drinking bottled water because there are much stronger regulation of tap water quality than bottled water quality. So don't be persuaded by all these um, bottled water adverts. Tap water is really safe to drink. The other thing to note here is that for some of these parameters, they vary during the course of the year. And I've highlighted here trihalomethanes. Trihalomethanes are formed by the reaction of dissolved organic carbon in water with chlorine uh, for the disinfection process. 
And in Scotland, we have quite high concentrations of dissolved organic carbon. You've probably noticed the colour of the water coming out of your tap sometimes is quite brown. And so there's a higher potential for trihalomethane formation to occur. And it particularly occurs at the, the end of the, the summer, the start of the autumn, when dissolved organic carbon is typically flushed out of our soils. So again, this is a sort of natural cause of drinking water quality variation. In terms of other measures we can take to improve water quality, I talked about planning measures and behavioural changes. This is an example of a, a farm waste management plan. And in this plan, the water sources are identified. There's a, a river shaded in blue here. There's the, the farm well, which supplies its drinking water. And the areas shaded in red around these are areas in which farm waste, animal wastes, shouldn't be spread at any time in order to protect the quality of these water sources. Another way of treating water pollution in a more sustainable, low-tech way is with constructed wetlands. These are used in a, a range of situations. This is a, a wetland at Monkton Hall former colliery on the outskirts of Edinburgh, which is treating mine water drainage. Wetlands are used to treat urban runoff. And they're also used for wastewater treatment at sewage treatment plants as well, both in the, the UK and throughout the world. So there are a number of advantages of these treatment measures. They often have lower costs than conventional engineered treatment. They're quite flexible in dealing with changes in inputs and they can have other benefits such as enhancing biodiversity. So I'm just going to finish off by giving an overview of what I think are some of the, the key water pollution and health issues in developing and developed countries. So developed countries are particularly um, affected by contaminated water and poor sanitation. And this has um, inputs on, on productivity and um, economic aspects. There's a particular issue with access to safe sanitation. We're a long way off meeting the Millennium Development Goal to achieve uh, safe sanitation for a large proportion of the world's population. There's still lots of problems with point source pollution control. Many countries have legislation to control point source pollution, but in effective regulation and uh, enforcement of that legislation. Corruption has been shown to be a, a big issue in financing improvements in water quality in developing countries. The World Bank estimates that between 20 and 40 percent of finances for water improvements in developing countries are lost due to corruption and that can be individual households uh, paying the, the water maintainer to, to do something about the system, something which the, the company should be doing anyway. Corruption can also take the form of bribes from companies paid to public officials for award of contracts. So corruption is a, a big issue in addressing water pollution. And it's also in these countries that there's the increasing pressures on water resources with expanding populations and a large proportion of water being used for agriculture as well and competing demands for water resources. In developed countries, diffuse source pollution is the largest problem. We're pretty good at regulating for point source pollution. We probably have a, 
heavy dependence on large-scale treatment and distribution systems, which can be a flaw because if something goes wrong, water pollution can spread through a, a large population. And it can also be a security risk uh, with uh, terrorism activities Emerging pollutants are probably a bigger problem in developed countries because of our greater use of these compounds and personal care products. And increasingly in developed countries, there's a, a move towards catchment management to reducing water pollution at source rather than treating the water once it's polluted. And there's a good example of that locally. Scottish Water have recently started a sustainable land management incentive scheme which pays land managers in a number of water supply areas in Scotland with particular diffuse source pollution problems to take extra measures beyond the minimum required of them to improve the water quality at source. The Scottish Water reckon that that's more cost effective to pay land managers to stop pollution at source rather than spending money on upgrading water treatment works. Finally, uh, some concluding points. I hope I've shown, convinced you that access to safe water and particularly sanitation is fundamental for human health. On the positive note, we do have a good understanding of the technical uh, solutions to water pollution of the, the causes, but the key challenges remain in implementing social and behavioural changes in order to affect these solutions. Particular things I've highlighted are um, in developing countries, prioritising work with women and girls who are often the main providers of water in these countries. It's also the behavioural changes from individual level such as washing, washing hands to avoid uh, ingesting contaminated water due to government activity. We probably need to be looking at effective water pricing, how to and also how to um, charge polluters to minimise water pollution. We also need to think of the, the global context about virtual water, water transfers in embedded goods, such as the, the clothes we wear, the food we buy, if that's sourced from other countries. The production of those commodities can have impacts on the water environment elsewhere. And we have to carry out all of this in an environment of change as well. OK, well, that's it for water pollution. I think we've got time for questions at the, at the end yeah. with the panel discussion. Thank you, Kate. So those questions.